In the 17th canto, Cacciaguida foretells Dante's exile from Florence, comparing it to that of Hippolytus, an Athenian prince, son of Theseus, who was exiled from Athens when his stepmother Phaedra accused him of attempting to force himself on her. Phaedra herself, like Potiphar's wife, was the actual erotic aggressor, and she falsely accused the youth when she was rebuffed. At left, we see illicit passion in cupid form descending on Phaedra. At center, Hippolytus leaves Athens. His eloquent gesture reflects De Paolo's and every reader's sympathy for exile Dante. At right, we see the fate of Hippolytus, which Dante doesn't mention. Theseus, believing Phaedra's slander, called down a curse on Hippolytus, which resulted in a fatal chariot wreck. The figure of Cacciaguida, with his crusader's cross on his chest, who himself died far from home, exhorts Dante here, as in the poem, to bear up bravely and tell all truly, confident of God's eventual justice. Here we have it left Dante's exile from Florence. He is literally thrust out of the gates by one of his fellow citizens. The lily on the shield identifies the city. The lily, Giglio, was used as an emblem of Florence for more than a thousand years, since the beginning of the Crusades. To the right, we see Dante in Verona, the guest of his patron, Con Grande della Scala. The poet looks out over the river Adige as he composes his poem. Still in the heaven of Mars, Cacciaguida leans out from behind the planet to explain the vision presented. Note that the war god has been made into an angelic intelligence by the addition of wings. Cacciaguida shows Dante that the great cross which dominates the heaven of Mars is actually filled with mobile, luminous souls. To Dante, they appear like bright spheres. Cacciaguida explains that they are the spirits of great heroes, including Charlemagne and Roland. Di Paolo has compromised between Dante's words and pictorial necessity by showing the heroes as figures from the waist up, the rest of their forms lost in golden radiance. The only one who can be identified here is Joshua, at top, for whom God delayed the sunset so he could finish an important battle. We are now in the sphere of Jupiter, the heaven of the just. The figure in the sphere greeting Dante and Beatrice may be a muse. Dante invokes the aid of all the muses in this canto, or perhaps the spirit of Jupiter who represents just rule. I personally favor the latter interpretation, which would make the eagle at right a more symbolic but equally winged representation of the same idea. The naked figures below Jupiter are the souls of the just who are in the process of coalescing into the corporate entity which is the great eagle, symbol of just rule, and incidentally the emblem of the holy Roman emperor. The gold bands enclosing the souls signify their radiant identities being swept upward into the giant avian form. Here in Canto 19, the eagle has fully taken shape. In the poem, Dante makes several essays at describing it. The brilliant souls that compose it are like living gems. The voices that unite as it speaks are a heavenly chorus. Dante depends on the music of his language to suggest the image, which he doesn't very precisely describe. It is a living symbol, and so Dante can sacrifice the figure to the figurative. This left the painter Di Paolo in an awkward position, and he chose the most literal solution. The results are hallucinatory rather than visionary. The levels of meaning accumulate without fusing. We are here in the realm of what one nowadays calls outsider art. And as with outsider art, it does convey a sense of the authentic. We believe that Dante really saw more than mortal eye may, in part because of this somewhat confused report. Di Paolo had an easier task here. In the text, the eagle embodiment of justice condemns a number of European rulers contemporary with Dante, who appear here enthroned below the book in which God has inscribed his judgments against them. As the artist has not distinguished them with emblems, we need not relate their identities. In the poem itself, they are little more than names, an indistinguishable collection of wretched scepters. 
In Canto 20, we meet the Just Rulers, who form the head of the Eagle. We are shown here the souls of Trajan, Hezekiah, David, and William II of Sicily. The only one requiring special notice here is David, who is shown with his harp. Being the ultimate exemplar of good rule, especially for Dante, since he was both a king and a poet, his radiant soul forms the pupil of the eagle's eye, which de Paolo represents by setting David both above and in place of it. <laughs> 